Ah, hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the internet personality of the best hair. And oh, would you look at that? May the 1st was on a Sunday this month. You know what that means. This month will have a Friday the 13th. But my reviews come out on Wednesdays, and I've already reviewed all the Friday the 13th movies. But, 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 but there are still plenty of Friday the 13th adjacent properties for me to review, such as Hatchet. Victor Crowley is played by Kane Hodder, the man who played probably the most iconic series of Jason Voorheeses out there, and I've only ever reviewed one of those movies. That's right, Hatchet is a long-running series at this point, with four movies from 2006 to 2017. Hatchet was followed up by the aptly titled Hatchet 2 in 2010. Kane Hodder returns as Victor Crowley, Tony Todd returns as Reverend Zombie, and everyone returns to the swamp to be picked off by the slasher killer once more, now imbued with sequel power. And I think I've reviewed enough Scream movies by now that you know what that means, but nevertheless, let's take a look at Hatchet 2, and see if it's a cut above the rest, or just a hatchet job all around. And who writes this crap? Oh yeah. BAM! The movie opens up right where the last one left off, and likely as literally away as cinematically possible. Spare one minor detail. The original actress for Mary Beth has been recast from Tamara Feldman to Danielle Harris, and Danielle would continue to portray Mary Beth for the remainder of the series. Considering Tamara suffers from multiple sclerosis, I think we can let this one slide. Either way, Mary must fight off Victor Crowley, poking his eye before she flees for her life, eventually being jump scare picked up by horror special effects specialist John Carl Buechler, playing the role of Jack Cracker. He's helping her, but is far too used to finding spare teenager parts from those who wouldn't take heed the legend of Victor Crowley. She explains she was looking for her father, who started hunting gators in this swamp, despite the warnings, because they really needed the money. Jack Cracker still thinks that's no excuse. Hell, every hunter from around here knows not to go in that damn swamp. I always tell him, I say, stay the hell out! And they all just go in anyway, and I stand here, shaking my fist at him, and I go, you stubborn bastards! Here. You drink this, it's nice and warm. Oh, I'll bet it is. Mary Beth is like, I should really call the police, but Jack scoffs at the notion. As if there aren't already hundreds of missing persons cases filed, and no city cop will get down to the swamp fast enough that the wildlife will not have eaten up all of the evidence anyway. She'd just consider herself lucky to be alive, whoever she is. But when she tells him she is in fact Mary Beth Dunstan. Get out! What? Get out of my house right now! Now get the hell off my property and give me my piss back! Evidently her father did some bad things and Jack doesn't want to get caught up in anything with the Dunstan family. What's going on? You want answers? You go see Reverend Zombie. Inhale. Or just down the way in New Orleans. Anyway, after he chases her off, he's sure he's safe from Crowley's wrath. I didn't do nothing wrong. I didn't know who she was. It don't count. And the fact that the movie remains focused on you as you continue your mundane existence really makes me sure you'll survive the next five minutes. But oh yeah, what was Jack doing out there anyway? Well, fishing for the possessions of the various victims of Victor, of course. Among them is a handy dandy handy cam, and what a jackpot it is, it's just full of all that horror nudity we all know and love. The unedited extra raw footage from Bayou Beavers. Mister, leave me alone! Come on, once you lift up that shirt, let's see what you got going on. Dude, I'm 14! Oh, well, that ain't right. And Jack might be a self-serving scavenger who would rather chase off a woman in clear need of help than actually help her at slight possible risk to himself, but even he knows there are lines you don't cross. Staying on this gag until it somehow does manage to overstay its welcome, the movie gets interesting again when spooky creaking is heard outside Jack Cracker's hut. That being the movement of Victor Crowley grabbing Jack by his intestines, preventing his escape, and then choking the man to death with his own guts. And the body count rises. Thus, after the opening credits and kick-ass music, We see that Mary Beth has managed to walk all the way down to Bourbon Street, where we find Reverend Zombie's voodoo shop, owned by Reverend Zombie, played by Tony Todd. Hearing she needs to talk to him right now, he allows her to enter. She tells him, hey, everyone is dead, habit in Honey Island Swamp. Honey Island Swamp. Were you on that tour? Yeah. You... How did you know? 
Well, that was Zombies, but you should at least be able to guess that Honey Island was a little familiar to Tony Todd. Zombie is upset to hear that so many died, but even worse, Sean, the guide, his employee was one of them, but worst of all! That was one of my boats. I lost his boat in the process! Oh, this day can't possibly get any worse! Oh, not my Dogecoin again! Zombie points out that Honey Island Swamp is restricted, so tours of the swamp are technically illegal, but hey, that's what makes them so profitable. And when money's tight, you gotta do what you gotta do. You sound just like my daddy. Who's your father? Samson Dunstan. Samson Dunstan. I don't know why everyone cares so much about Samson in this movie. I was a lot more interested in him in the first movie when he was played by Robert fucking England. Well, how is old Samson doing? He's dead. Yeah, horror movie openings will do that to you. That, combined with the fact that Jack Cracker did tell her that she could get answers from Zombie, resulted in him giving a good old-fashioned exposition dump. They retcon a tad here and there, but don't worry, it's all narrated by Tony Todd, and that's a hell of a voice for a storyteller. Victor's father, Thomas, was also played by the man, the legend, Kane Hodder. And he was a very caring man. His wife, Cheyenne, played by Catherine Fiore, was slowly dying to death, and he was caring for her. Along with the hot young nurse, Lena, played by Erica Hamilton. And over the long months of Cheyenne's passing, Thomas and Lena got closer. And you know what that means. They started to... Now, hold on. They, uh, called the magical stork. And it wasn't until later that Cheyenne finally passed, and her pain was over. But the moment was not so much a release as it was a nightmare. Because being an adulterous bastard turns your dying wife into a mother and swamp witch! Cursing Thomas, Lena, and the unborn Victor Crowley. Jeez, it's not the kid's fault. Well, Cheyenne can die again now, and we can skip ahead to Victor's birth. Surprise! He's horribly deformed. And Lena. Some say she died the moment she laid eyes on her child. Oh, damn, so much for having a face only a mother could love. Anyway, now we're back on the backstory from the first movie, but this time Thomas isn't just trying to keep his deformed son safe from the outside world, he's trying to hide his own shame in their seclusion. But they weren't secluded enough, as a small group of assholes set fire to the house! Thomas tried to save his son by chopping through the door with a hatchet. But he forgot to take into account that he's Jason fucking Voorhees, and these things just kinda happen. So Thomas lived out the rest of his life tormented by that night. The people responsible getting away scot-free, denying everything. And Victor, well, sometime later, Victor started murdering people one by one in over-the-top slasher movie fashion. Massacred and torn to pieces by the ghosts of Victor Crowley. What does it have to do with me? Well, Jesus Christ, Mary Beth, not everything has to be about you. Samson was one of the three kids who murdered Victor Crowley. Yeah, okay, fuck that guy. Victor coming after Mary Beth because her father was an asshole is like someone coming after me because my dad wasn't the greatest guy on the planet. And they're like, yeah, I agree. Zombie knows this because Samson invited him to torment Victor all those years ago, though the younger zombie turned him down on his offer. But the big thing about that night is that it creates a specific kind of ghost in the world of the paranormal. His tragic and untimely death has left him forced to relive that moment, night after night, over and over. <laughs> that's not paranormal, that's just good old-fashioned childhood trauma. And yeah, Victor's a geist that is polter as fuck, murdering everyone who enters that swamp. Mary Beth is like, ah, you mean like those tour boats of people you knowingly sent in like an asshole? Zombie's like, not my fault, Sean wasn't supposed to go that deep. He fucked up, not me. Besides, you all knew the legends and went in anyway, so don't blame me for this shit. Consider yourself lucky. Lucky? My family is gone! 
Yeah, I am beginning to see how they were the lucky ones. So yeah, this swamp of evil that no one should ever enter, she'd like to go back right away. Tell zombies because she wants to collect the random pieces of family members strewn around and give them a proper burial, but zombie can tell she has an ulterior motive. She wants to kill Victor Crowley. But how could she if he's an unkillable supernatural undead slasher villain? Maybe I can't. Maybe I can. Oh fuck it, if I do manage to pull it off, there's gonna be plenty of fan theories explaining how it was actually possible all along, so let's hop to it! And Zombie's gonna help. Why? Because Mary Beth threatens to tell the police about his illegal swamp tours and body count if he doesn't. So, uh, fair enough, he's going to help. But he's going to do more than help. Zombie's so all in on this plan, he's gonna help gather up an entire hunting party to take down Victor Crowley, with a few specialists of his choice to boot. And not only that. Do you have somebody you can bring? Boyfriend? Or an uncle, perhaps? We can't just have Victor carving up miscellaneous assholes all movie. We need someone you have a real connection to to get that proper emotional response. Mary Beth is like, fuck that, not gonna get more of my family killed out there, but Zombie turns the tails and says he won't help her unless she does bring some family along. As we've forgotten her threat to tell the police at this point, uh, oh well, she begrudgingly agrees to those terms and heads out so we can meet a new character. Justin, get your butt down here. Yeah, boss? Justin, Sean's convenient twin brother, played by Perry Shen. He also just so happens to work for Zombie, and as he was out of frame, he didn't hear any of that back and forth between Zombie and Mary Beth. So Zombie fills him in. Hey, Sean never brought the boat back, so we gotta go out there and retrieve it. Sean's still in the swamp? Apparently. Is he alright? I'm sure he'll be alright. Just gonna leave out the part about the, uh, the dead brother and the, the dead customers, the, the dead everyone. Just, just uh, don't, don't, don't mention that. It's not important. If he does that, then how's he gonna get Justin to go around and find the most badass hunters in Louisiana and return to Honey Island Swamp to find the boat? Back with Mary Beth, however, she meets up with Uncle Bob, played by famed historian, writer, and horror screenwriter Tom Holland. First things first, he's not a fan of Reverend Zombie. His name is Clive Washington, for Christ's sake. Okay, uh, interesting vocal shift there. Did they dub over that? Was getting a name we only ever hear once right that important? Uncle Bob doesn't like Reverend Dumbass or any of this Victor Crowley bullshit. But Mary Beth refuses to budge on this. She will be going to the swamp, with or without Bob's help. He can't control her actions, but he can try and get the police. He does ask her to stay away from the zombie, though. I promise. How long until oh, Fuck, you already did it! As we find ourselves back at Reverend Zombie's voodoo shop, now packed full of Louisiana's finest gator hunters. Or, um, you know, some locals, anyway. Such as Leighton, played by proficient indie film actor A.J. Bowen, and Leighton's ex-crush Avery, played by Alexis Kendra. She's semi-stalking him, but he's here for the 500 bucks to pay for that wedding to someone other than Avery. I'm not, I'm not getting into this with you. I'm single. Oh, Trevian! And we can't forget Trent over there, played by R.A. Mihailov. You know, Leatherface from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. No time for the young and the restless, though. We gotta bring out Reverend Zombie. He gives us a little show before cutting the music and getting down to business. There is a boat out there. His boat. And he needs that boat. Now, of course, I'm not offering y'all $500. Remember to like and subscribe. Boat. What? The video. You should like it. It helps. I, I mean, no harm in subscribing, all I'm saying. He's willing to pay everyone here $500 each if the group manages to bring his boat back. It sounds like a lot more than a new boat would cost, but it's not just the boats, no. They're gonna prove it's safe to go into Honey Island Swamp and open up a whole new spot to hunt in. Only one little caveat. What are we hunting? Victor Crowley. Honestly, you probably should have led with that. Hearing the mission is 500 bucks to face certain death, the vast majority of those present decide to just say fuck it and leave. Zombie tries to call them back, saying the legend of Victor Crowley is just that, a legend, and if there is a killer in the swamp, all they gotta do is shoot the son of a bitch. Still, very few remain, but Zombie works extra hard to make sure that Trent, the best shot of the bunch, sticks around, paying his 500 bucks in advance and promising a further 500 on completion. And besides, if it does turn bad, they can just turn back. 
But what's this? While everyone was leaving, Uncle Bob showed up! No word on what happened with the police thing, it doesn't come up. But Bob has decided to join this expedition as a means to keep Mary Beth safe no matter what. However, Chad, played by David Foy, doesn't even know who this Victor Crowley is. Maniac who haunts Honey Island. People just use it to keep kids away from the swamp. You mean like a Jason Voorhees or something? In more ways than one. Zombie sweetens the deal even more for those who haven't left yet, saying that the head of Victor Crowley will bring in a sweet five grand to whoever can get it. As such, they head out. The Cajun lady brings most of the crew while Chad, Avery, and Layton ride on the personal boat of Cletus, played by Ed Ackerman. Who doesn't really have much of a horror pedigree as far as I can find, but in 2010 he was in Aeroscope's Pictures Frozen as Jason, and in 2011 he acted in the changeup as Victor. Close enough. So how come we don't get to ride in the boat with them boys up there? I take my own boat wherever I go. What the hell for? Biscuits and chicken and gravy and biscuits and chicken and gravy. Probably saw the comic relief character from a mile away and decided to give him a wide berth. Vernon, played by the comedy actor, writer, and producer Colton Dunn. He's got to torture the rest of them, including John, played by stuntman Rick McCallum, and Reverend Zombie. Not only was Tony Todd's role for this movie already larger than Hatchet 1, he's sticking around for the entire adventure. First things first, hey, they found the boat! Or, uh, you know, part of it. Probably about what they'll find of any of the members of the tour to boot. In any case, they make landfall, and the sun's about to go down, so they head into the good old-fashioned forest of no return. Mary Beth is their guide, and unfortunately for them, she's only been here once before and came in a different way, so has absolutely no idea which way to go to get to the Crowley house. So what, we break up into groups? No. That's a bad idea. No, no, he's right. That way we can cover more ground. With entrails, but still. Not only is splitting up kind of dumb, but Bob points out that having a bunch of scared, drunken, stupid assholes running around in the dark with guns might not be the smartest move, killer, ghost on the loose or not. No one cares, though. The plan is to run off in different directions and meet back up at the boat come sunrise. Get the head, get the five grand. Hey, man, I got an idea. Why don't we all just split up? <laughs> hey, better yet, let's just go skinny dipping. Do some drugs. Steal some shit. Have premarital... Deep conversations. Cletus and Chad decide to hang out close to the boats. Two reasons. One, they don't want anyone leaving without them, and two, Cletus is certain that Victor Crowley doesn't exist. That's the only reason Zombie offered five grand for the head, because there's no head to return. But he might be able to make a little score with some nighttime gator hunting. But weird noises out of the woods leave them to wonder. <laughs> And for Cletus to just run the fuck off. Kind of a problem with being absolutely certain he doesn't exist. He was not prepared to face him. So Victor bashes in Chad's face, beating it over and over until it's not but a bloody mess. But let's take a break from this little massacre for some more exposition. Justin wonders why a search party would need so many guns, so Zombie explains to the kid, okay, you know, Victor, well, he is real, but there is a key to breaking the curse. Gotta let him kill everyone responsible for that tragic night. And it just so happens that Trent and Samson's brother were the other two kids that night who set fire to the Crowley home. So they die, and it's all good. It's like murder. Am I hurting anybody? Do I tell you how to do your job? Well, yeah, you're my boss. Fair point. Anyway, back with Cletus, he decides he's gonna get the hell out of here, but the boat won't push start, so he has to pull the engine cable, which allows Victor to pull him under the water, killing him with his own boat engine. On a lighter note, we suddenly jump over to Leighton and Avery, and after a little heart-to-heart... -heart, ah, do you like that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so it's to start having a, a lot to talk about. But Victor will have none of that, chopping Leighton's head off before jamming his hatchet deep into Avery's rather exposed chest. Anyway, back with Zombie and friends. They found the house. Couldn't find Mary Beth's familial remains just yet, and Uncle Bob thinks they should leave. Also, Justin thinks they should leave. And even Trent thinks they should leave. But strange noises noise strangely. Shut the door! Shut the fucking door! You tell him, Mary Beth. What were they, raised in a barn? Thus, they barricade themselves inside the Crowley house. All except for John and Vernon, of course, they're still off in the swamp, unaware of all the death, disembowelments, decapitations, and deep discussions that have transpired. But this is actually something Crowley hasn't faced before. Two well-armed men, at least one of them competent, and actually willing to shoot the bastard. So how is he gonna take them on? 
everyone's favorite, the motherfucking chainsaw! One of those super long chainsaws like we saw in Mandy. That way, he can pick both of them up by the scruts, sawing through them in the most painful way possible, multiplied by two. In the meantime, Justin's freaking out, and Uncle Bob tells Mary Beth that she'd better hide. Well, don't gotta tell Justin twice, as he opts to join her somewhere away from the horrifying murderer on the prowl. But them alone isn't the best outcome, as Justin learns of the fact that Zombie lied, and they knew his brother was dead. And Mary Beth finds out that Zombie lied, and they didn't want Uncle Bob to help, but his sacrifice as a means to grant Victor Crowley's revenge! That's why he brought us here? I don't... All I know is... Uncle Bob! <laughs> the liar lied and the murderer is trying to murder you! It's hard to believe, I know. So she runs off to warn her uncle, leaving Justin all alone. Well, not all alone. <laughs> I don't know why everyone's so concerned with barricading doors and searching to make sure there's no secondary entrances when they're facing a slasher villain. Teleportation powers come as standard with those. So he pins Justin to the wall with the hatchet. That's not nearly creative enough for this late in the movie. No, this calls for the belt sander, so Crowley can grind into the back of Justin's head, giving him the smoothest of all smooth brains. Hearing this, Bob realizes Crowley's in the house and goes to fight him to protect Mary Beth. But first, it's Victor Crowley versus Leatherface in a knockdown drag out brawl! Trent actually holds his own long enough for Zami to interrupt the scene and drag Mary Beth off, giving Victor ample time for his two victims. First, with Trent, let's have a little off the top. Okay, now I want one of those as a centerpiece for the dining room and a possible cookie jar. Uncle Bob can't escape, though, as Zombie shoots the lock on the rotten, weak-looking door, doing the opposite of most movies and making the lock unbreakable. Bob's not pleased about the situation, but he at least goes down fighting like a man. Like a man out of frame, as all we see out of that brawl is Victor Crowley pounding out some of Bob's burgers. With that, Zombie is certain the curse is finally lifted. Crowley is sated, and now he can rest in peace. Just uh, one little issue with that. Bob was my daddy's best friend. My daddy's brother died from leukemia when I was 12. Oh! So, um... Got another way to break the curse? No time to find out now as Victor Crowley attacks! The horror brawls just keep coming and now it's Crowley versus Candyman! A much less impressive fight. Seems without his bees in the hook, Tony Todd doesn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Okay, with all the other horror knobs this movie has given, I have to ask, does that count as a Hellraiser reference? So Zombie is dead. But what's this? Mary Beth Dunstan rushes in with a hatchet, attacking Crowley head on. And this is how our movie ends. She just beats the ever-loving fuck out of the unkillable monster until she looks like she just came off the set of Evil Dead. Fuck you! The end, they're all dead, except for Mary Beth. Sounds kind of familiar. Anyway, that was Hatchet 2. Ah, body counts. This was a horror movie for fans of horror in two ways. Number one, the amount of horror alumni walking around, not as mere cameos, but full on characters for the entire film. It's impressive. Number two, if you don't know them and aren't geeking out over seeing Candyman and Leatherface duke it out with Jason Voorhees, there's not all that much going on here. The setup is effective, but it pulls off a similar setup as the first movie, but again. Let's be honest here, it ain't no Evil Dead 2 when it comes to retelling the original, but better. So as a horror movie, Hatchet 2 is a no frill slasher romp for gore hounds, and at that it's also a little hit and miss. The kills are certainly creative, with literal buckets of blood being thrown left and right, but the gore effects aren't all that high quality, which leaves a viewer in that little area where it looks fake enough to enjoy, but gets gruesome enough to give you some uncomfortable tingles. Personally, I really enjoyed this movie. It's a nice continuation of Hatchet, and while effectively repeating the first movie doesn't make it the most creative, having so many faces of horror along for the whole ride this time made it easy to geek out over. For the uninitiated, however, Hatchet 2 probably won't be the film to really get you into horror. Coming in at three intensely intimate conversations out of five. Not jaw-dropping, per se. At least not until Victor's done wriggling it out of your face, but... Uh... Thank you all for watching. I've been Decker Shadow, 
And remember, always have at least two backup exorcisms at the ready, just in case. Drop the towels. Touch walking hepatitis over here.